they ripped out a century of genius and called it progress. Why historic radiators still outsmart modern heating. The biggest lie ever sold to homeowners wasn't vinyl siding or open-plan kitchens. It was this idea that old heating systems were dumb, inefficient and obsolete. That cast-iron radiators were relics. That progress meant ripping them out. And the moment we did, comfort got worse, energy bills climbed and buildings started failing in ways no one saw coming. This isn't nostalgia talking. This is physics, history and hard-earned lessons staring us in the face. Today we're going to demystify historic radiators and expose why so many modern improvements failed us, especially when tested under real pressure, including World War II, especially then. This is for History HQ, and this is for people who actually care how things work. Why historic radiators were engineered for reality, not marketing. Historic radiators weren't designed by branding teams. They were built by engineers who understood thermodynamics because failure meant frozen pipes, sick families or factories grinding to a halt. These systems were sized for worst-case scenarios. Deep winter, poor insulation, fuel shortages, human error. They didn't aim for theoretical efficiency. They aimed for reliability. Cast iron radiators work on thermal mass. They absorb heat slowly and release it steadily. That means, well, fewer temperature swings. Rooms don't spike hot and then plunge cold. Once a radiator is warm, it stays warm, even when the boiler cycles off. That steady output is why old buildings feel comfortable instead of drafty, even at lower air temperatures. Modern systems often chase quick heat, thin metal, forced air, rapid on, rapid off. That creates hot ceilings, cold floors, dry air and constant cycling. It feels efficient on paper. It feels miserable in practice. What World War II revealed about heating systems under stress? World War II put infrastructure through hell. Fuel rationing, power interruptions, buildings repurposed overnight, hospitals, barracks, factories, offices, all pushed beyond design limits. Historic radiator systems didn't just survive. They adapted. Steam and hot water systems could, you know, run on multiple fuel types, coal, oil and, well, even wood in emergencies. They didn't depend on complex electronics. Just a valve, a pipe, gravity, pressure, that's it. When fuel was scarce, operators could simply reduce output without the whole system collapsing. And when parts failed, they were, quite often, repairable right there on site. Modern systems, by contrast, rely so much on precision components. Sensors, control boards, tight tolerances. Miss just one part and the whole system, well, it locks out. In a survival context, that's not really progress. That's fragility. The reason old radiators heat people, not just air. Here's the part, honestly, most HVAC conversations miss. Radiators heat surfaces, walls, floors, furniture, bodies. They work largely through radiant heat, not just convection. That means you feel warm, even if, say, the air temperature is lower. That's why a room at 65 degrees with radiators feels better than a room at 72 with forced air. 
Modern forced air systems, well, they chase air temperature alone. They heat the air fast, blow it around, lose it through leaks, then shut off and, you know, repeat the whole cycle. It's noisy, uneven, and honestly, it's dependent on constant airflow. On the other hand, radiant systems are silent, stable, and, I must say, calm. This really matters historically because, you see, buildings before the mid-twentieth century were designed around radiant heat. Thick walls, high ceilings, and slow thermal exchange were the norm. If you rip out the radiators and replace them with forced air, suddenly the building itself is, well, fighting the system. Why did modern retrofits break buildings instead of actually improving them? When historic radiators were removed, the replacement systems were, quite often, undersized. Engineers assumed modern insulation values that, frankly, didn't exist. Or they relied on efficiency ratings measured under laboratory conditions. The result was, well, predictable, cold spots condensation, mould, and structural rot. Radiators kept walls warm. That prevented moisture from condensing inside masonry. Remove them and cold walls meet warm indoor air. Water forms. Decay begins. This isn't theory. Preservationists have documented this failure pattern repeatedly. A so-called upgrade ends up shortening the lifespan of the building. Comfort drops, maintenance rises, and no one connects the dots back to the heating system that was never meant to be removed. What the survivalists understand that most homeowners don't. If you're thinking like a survivalist, historic radiator systems start looking less old-fashioned and more strategic. They operate quietly. They don't need electricity to distribute heat. They tolerate fuel variability. They can be manually controlled. In a grid-down scenario, a gravity-fed hot water system paired with a simple boiler can keep a structure livable. Even a small heat source can maintain baseline warmth because the thermal mass carries you through downtime. Try that with a modern heat pump in sub-zero weather and no power. You won't get far. How modern efficiency metrics misled an entire generation. The obsession with AFUE ratings and seasonal efficiency numbers distorted decision-making. These metrics focus on fuel-to-heat conversion, not heat delivery quality. They don't measure comfort stability. They don't measure resilience. They don't measure building health. You know, a system can be 95% efficient and still feel, well, awful. Sometimes, a radiator system that's technically less efficient on paper can actually outperform in lived experience. Historic engineers, they optimised for outcomes, not just numbers. These days, modern systems tend to optimise for spreadsheets instead. And that really is the disconnect. So... How do we apply this knowledge today without, you know, feeling like we're living in a museum? This isn't about rejecting modern technology outright, far from it. It's about integration instead of replacement. In fact, many historic radiator systems can be upgraded with modern boilers, better controls and zoned valves, all while keeping the radiators themselves. If you're restoring an older building, well, step one is to assess radiator sizing. Those oversized units are an asset, not a floor. 
Step two is improving insulation strategically, you know, without sealing the building so tight that it can't breathe. Step three is pairing the system with a boiler that can modulate output instead of short cycling. For survival-minded setups, consider maintaining at least one gravity-capable loop. Avoid over-reliance on electronics. Learn how to bleed, balance, and manually regulate the system. These are skills, not conveniences. What history teaches us about real progress is, well, real progress isn't just about being newer. It's about being better, especially under pressure. You see, historic radiators passed the test of time because they were designed for a world where, honestly, failure simply wasn't an option. World War II proved that. Harsh winters proved that. And, you know, a whole century of continuous use proved that too. Modern improvements didn't fail because technology itself is bad. No, they failed because, frankly, they ignored context. They treated buildings like interchangeable boxes instead of, well, systems with memory. If you're really serious about history and truly serious about survival, then this lesson absolutely matters. Comfort, resilience, longevity. The old engineers, they knew exactly what they were doing. If this kind of deep, no-nonsense history is what you came for, then honestly make sure you subscribe to History HQ. Share this with someone who still thinks ripping out radiators is an upgrade. And stick around, because, well, the past has a lot more to teach us than we've been told.